Hey, Bracken. Hello, Kirk. Bracken, um, you had a big day yesterday that I think we should chat about. You um, think so? This is public worthy? I think so. Yeah, I think it's public worthy because it's a big step in your professional direction. And typically we record these podcast folks on Mondays. They're released Tuesdays, but we could not record yesterday on Monday because Bracken was busy doing something that scared him. Mm -hmm. made him a little nervous and it took up a majority of your day. So we're recording late on Tuesday. This episode will be a little shorter than normal due to a time crunch, but um, yeah, it's a big deal. I want to hear about yesterday, what, what you did, how it went. Well, I had my first corporate speaking engagement yesterday. This is something that has been a long-term goal of mine and the long-term meant not now, not yet. But there's a a gentleman in my life. That's a weird intro. He's like an uncle, but he's not blood. Um, but he is a he's been C level in companies for the last I don't know forty fifty years. He's super successful. But um, I asked him to basically run an audit on me and us over the winter. Uh, facilitate growth. Find ways that I'm leaving things on the table. Uh, my background is teaching. It's not business. And I, I need to lean on people. Anyway, I made the mistake of mentioning to him, not m mentioning, he was asking our 5, 10, 15 year goals, all that. And the long term idea was to write and speak more and pull back slightly on the coaching. Only work with the people you absolutely mm -hmm. want to rather than, you know, how it is. Sometimes you take on clients at the gym just because the lights have to stay on. And that's not going to go over great. This is the second week in a row I've mentioned that some of the people I work with are my friends and stuff like that. <laughs> but that's just the reality of life. I, right. I want to <laughs> be able to coach less, but not stop, but do other things more. And for him, because he's a hard charging corporate level um, dynamo, he understands that uh, later often means never. And that the earlier you start, yep. the earlier compound interest starts in every sense of the word. And so he immediately uh, said, hey, I have an opportunity for you in four weeks. And would you like to take it? Yes or yes. <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> I did not want to. I was terrified. And I preached that that's what you have to do. If, if you're in that situation, you just have to do the thing that terrifies you. So I did it. And that was yesterday. And it was everything I needed it to be. And I'm very excited now to do the next one. Uh, if it scares you, it's probably going to grow you. Yes. And if it scares you, you should probably do it. Yes. Um, the older we get, uh, the less and less things make us nervous, scare us, um, make us feel insecure, so to speak. And going into avenues in which provoke those feelings is always good because our opportunities for growth becomes less, less and less as we age. Uh, but you didn't say what you did exactly. What did you do exactly? Exactly. You gave a speech yes. or a presentation. Yeah. To whom? About what? Uh, this was to a, so the company I gave it to oversees the, and facilitates the running of adults with disability day homes. And this was to their providers, people who are working with the members and uh, directly running the homes where the adults with disabilities are housed and living and so the first two, I was the third speaker. Um, the first two talked about the ins and outs of improving their specific tasks of their job. And I piggybacked on that, but from a, what the endurance world can tell us about handling the fatigue and exhaustion that comes from lines of work that ex deal with extreme passions and people are extre extremely passionate, um, when you work with people with disabilities. So how to be on every day, how to pace yourself, how to deal with those moments when you're just exhausted, but you have to be on for a clientele mm. that really feeds off of your emotions. Mm. Bringing your worlds together, so to speak. It was a great, is how I look at it with your. Yeah, it was a great yeah. uh, world to start in with this because the two things I know and have done professionally are the two things that uh, were useful to this population. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I called, so um, 
I forgot that Bracken and I weren't recording at our normal time. And I called him yesterday because my internet had gone out uh, and it was out all day. And so I was calling him to be like, we can't record. And he said, well, we're not recording today anyways, idiot. Do you remember? And you told me the one thing you were having a hard time with or the thing that that took the most brain power was, uh, as we've said many times, a peek behind the curtain with this podcast is we don't really like to prep. We like to keep everything conversational. We like to go in whatever direction or avenue feels right at the time. Of course, we we do light prep work, but we're not very regimented with our guest interviews, with our training Tuesdays. We have an idea and we let it take us where it takes us. And you told me that you had to do prep and had to have like PowerPoint presentation and had mm-hmm. to have a format. And that was hard for you because we're so good. We're like so used to going free flow format. So that was a yeah. period of growth for you as well. You had to be you had to be handcuffed. Yeah. All I want to do is whatever inspiration I take from what word was just said or an expression from someone in the audience or the one thing they react to, I want to just lean into that and go, but like the next Mm -hmm. slide is waiting. So balancing that act was what I was most worried about. However, when we got there with the setup of the room and the way uh, um, they, they didn't have the lavalier mic, they only had their handheld microphone. And then I had a clicker Mm -hmm. for the PowerPoint presentation in my other hand. Um, so I didn't have my hands free and there wasn't space where I was to be located for my iPad, which had my speech notes on it. Uh, so I, I didn't get to use my notes. So it, luckily we've had oh. 429 episodes now and, uh, 32 with Benny before that and 20 to 30 Spartan broadcast, don't you, you know, 500. Don't you dare talk about your former lover. Don't I just feel like with you, it's a safe former. place. Whereas your I'm former lovers host. were shown on Don't network you. television. <laughs> I feel like this is a safe place. Where <laughs> Just I kidding. I have no ill will. Okay. Anyway. All right. Bracken, Point for those is- you don't know, had a, had a previous podcast and a previous co-host that he ditched. I, I guarded and protected Bracken's heart and stole him away from his previous podcast host. And That's now exactly he's, how it now he's mine. <laughs> yep. But those 500 reps Continue. of free-flowing allowed me to uh, be a little bit more comfortable not being able to have my preordained speech in front of me. So it was, it was a new Mm -hmm. venue. I was very uncomfortable to begin with. Um, but our reps that we've done together, uh, kept me at least on the rails when, uh, when things went off the rails. So I was very thankful for you and the running public audience during this because it, I could, I could lean back into that chair. Yeah, I'm sure you were thinking of us while you were up there, I'm sure. Yeah. So, speaking of all these reps, um, since we have just a little bit of a condensed timeline today, which happens to us on occasion, we're busy working people and such. Sometimes these things get crammed in. Doesn't mean the content's going to suck. It's just going to be a little shorter than normal. And I was out running a big workout for me today. As I mentioned, I have Grandma's Half Marathon on my calendar. Uh, Grandma's Half is at the end of June. As much running, racing, and experience I have, I haven't raced on the roads in like five years. Like truly raced. I've time trialed. I've trained, but I've done trail and OCR, and I've done some track 5Ks. And anyway, never a half, so I was correct? out doing four by. Um, I mean, I've never a true half. No, any not a road half. Mm-mm. No, yeah. although I did look. So in a long quality long run, I ran five. 544 pace in the middle guess. of a quality long run with some like intervals. Yeah. One fourteen twenty. It comes out to I think it came out to like one fourteen high. Or one fifteen oh. Failed. Something like that. It was from a quarter mile on quarter mile float workout where I did twenty four reps of that, which is twelve miles of quality on and off. Anyways, doesn't matter. But that popped up. So I guess technically I've run one in training, but it was mm-hmm. amidst a workout. So I have some sort of number down. But not to sidetrack myself, um, I don't know why I was thinking this, but the workout went well. I worked quite hard. I did four by two miles with two minutes rest. Last week I did some three mile intervals with some quarters in between. I did a broken tempo, you could call it. However, on the way back and my cool down, my legs really started feeling it. And I was just starting to think like, oh, like, should I be doing two mile reps here? Or like, do do I need to go shorter than this? Like, should I be doing even higher turnover work? Um, 
And then I got to thinking, I was like, okay, well, Kirk, let's use logic here and let's talk yourself through this. If you were training for a mile, Bracken, I guess I'll ask you, would you consider quarter mile repeats speed work for the mile? If it potentially? was potentially, if it was mile pace or faster, yeah. Okay. And what percentage of a mile is a quarter mile? Oh, you're asking the wrong guy, but like a quarter of it. <laughs> 25%. Okay. So here I am doing two mile reps, right? I just do Half want to be pedantic. It's not 25% of a mile. Okay. It's just under. Okay. You're yeah. right. Because <laughs> we'll hear about that. Yep. 24.98 or something like that. All right. Because 1609 is truly a mile. Blah, blah. Okay. 400 meter repeats. You feel better? That wouldn't work either. Much. All right. You're doing math now. I can see it. Just tell us. Do put it in your calculator. Tell us how much of a quarter, what percent a quarter mile repeat is of a mile. Well, I don't know how to set that math up. And a quarter mile, no, a quarter mile repeat, if it is. If a quarter mile repeat is truly a quarter of a mile, it's still 25%. But a quarter mile repeat of is 24.86 of a 1600. So you're actually splitting needless hairs here. Yes. All right. Huh. So I'm running these two mile repeats. I get done with it, <laughs> doing my cool down. And I'm like, all right, like when should I start speed training? Like when should I start really ripping? as I periodize my lead into grandma's half right now, I'm doing strength work, you know, two mile repeats, two minute rest, trying to get down to adder goal or faster than goal race pace. And then I thought, okay, so if I would consider quarter mile repeats speed work for a mile, well, what's a quarter of a half marathon? It's over three miles. Mm -hmm. So by this theory, could you consider three mile repeats? speed work for a half marathon and then it got me down this black rabbit hole in my brain about like so what really is speed work everybody always wants more speed work i need turnover work but if you're running a percentage of your future race at or faster than goal race pace it opens up the door to like should you really feel that desperate to go rip quarter mile repeats if you have a half marathon on your schedule should you really be that desperate to go rip quarter mile repeats if you have a 5k on your schedule like what is speed work and how does it apply to all of this? And I know we've touched on it in the past, sort of, but I just thought we'd open Pandora's box and just like um, chat it out a little bit today. That's, that's my intro. It's a great intro. And this is the type of conversation that we have on our coaching calls, right? These are the things that come up during these conversations with our athletes of, okay, so I know this to be true. And now is this true as a result? And instead of, uh, instead of helping you at all, which I think is what you thought I was going to do. I'm going to ask a, uh, mm. a non-sarcastic rebuttal in return, which is, yep. Sure. So for a hundred mile race is a 25 mile interval feed work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it's at or faster than goal mile goal race pace, Sure. Yeah. And so the point is like at some point linear logic uh. with endurance sports always breaks down. Always. Yeah. So I just well, want to start break down? being a bit of a jerk. I guess. Well, you've kind of been a jerk since I started talking about this with being annoying yeah. with the quarter mile repeat percentage. I think yeah. this is what happens. I'm tired. I'm, uh, I'm overworked today. And you're just getting, you're getting me at my worst here, Kirk. No, what I think is you had to be so buttoned up yesterday in front of a professional crowd that you ha you couldn't be even a percentage of a jerk. And now it's all coming out on the back end today with me. I, I got to tell you something before I move on. I, the biggest issue I had was over whether or not to include a diarrhea joke in my opening. <laughs> That's the biggest problem you had. Well, because I needed to wake this crowd up and go because I was the third hour straight of them listening to people. I needed I needed interaction mm -hmm. right from the start. And there's multiple ways to do that. But 
like some sort of laughter or engagement is really good. Uh, but you can't bomb a diarrhea joke to a corporate crowd. <laughs> like that's that's kind of right on the edge of what do you or do you not. So that that was my mm -hmm. big. So I wasn't entirely buttoned down yesterday. Did you open with it? I did. I did a soft opening where I opened the door for it, where it wasn't at all apparent where it was going to go, but it was in nature in line with that. And if I got any reaction to that, I was going to kick the door open. And if I didn't get any action, I was going to... I was going to move right on with the next, uh, with the backup plan. And you got action and then you told the got joke. Got some action and then I, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. So. <laughs> to answer your question. This you is asked, supposed to be a very. <laughs> it's yeah. not. To, ask, to answer the question that you asked. Um, yeah, I believe that long reps still qualify as speed work. Now, speed work is one of those things we've talked about before, writing a book or having a list of simply definitions for runners. And speed work is like tempo work, where everyone has a different definition of it. We've done our best to demystify threshold, mm -hmm. but tempo, speed, what does speed mean? So I'm going to define it two ways. The first is at any pace that is faster than the fastest you will you will race at if it's faster than your race pace i consider it speed work in some regard and the second is if you use a stride that is more aggressive than what you will use during the race now they don't have to be both at the same time you can run faster than race pace with the same stride mm -hmm. you'll see that in an ultra you don't have to change your stride much to go from 11 10 pace down to 10 50 pace but now it's over it's over race pace right. or that one deviation more aggressive in your stride. It's more open. You're more forefoot. Your arms are pumping more. Those are my two uh, kind of boxes to check. If you check either one of those, I call it speed work. Those are great boxes to check. Thinking through my workout today. I don't. So I started these reps roughly 527 pace for my first. And my last finished about 513 pace. Okay. Okay. I don't know if I changed strides necessarily. Right. Until I started reaching the last half mile of the last two mile repeat. So with that logic, like sometimes speed doesn't also always equal a, a change in stride or an in, you know, maybe an increase in cadence, of course, but like. I can't say I used a different stride at all until I started to have the piano land on my back just a bit on that last rep. Right. I felt like it was the race stride I was going to use. So do you feel like if it's, it's, could it be as black and white as like pacing? Yeah. Like, race and if you are going faster. out and running. Right. All right. So if your goal was to run a four minute mile, which would be Nobody hears goals to run a four minute mile, but it's for sake of math. 60 second quarters on the head. And you went out and did eight by a quarter with three minutes rest between. So your goal is to run hard, fast, take a lot of rest. 60 flat, do you call it speed work, even though it's exactly, exactly goal pace? I would, I would especially for short what races. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would. I think for short races, it becomes way more applicable. Yeah. I think it gets cloudier the longer you get. Okay. So then do you believe, and I have thoughts on this, of course, but I'd like to kick it to you first, Let's catch you on your heels. Do you believe, let's say for a half marathon, that four by two miles with two minutes walk recovery was a speed session? I don't think it was and a speed so, session. And if so, or if not, either do I but I was running at or faster than goal race pace. Correct. And so I'm going to have a caveat to that is that I cannot count anything that's lactate threshold mm. or slower as speed work. And it might be as low as like 15 to 20 mm. minute race pace or, or, or longer mm. does not qualify for me. I will say that you probably hit some speed in there <laughs> towards the end, but it was not a speed <laughs> workout per se. And as I'm talking, I'm realizing I am not helping to clarify our topic whatsoever. And it just reinforces to me what? why this was a great idea by you. Well, right. This is a cloudy situation. You, 
you start to do thinking. I'm starting to project like, you know, Bracken, you like to make your 52 week training plan, or at least you used to, right? Like you like to like really make these romantic long training plans. I don't, I literally wake up that week and say, body, tell me what you need really. And I really enjoy going about it that way. But now I'm starting to think a little bit ahead for the next six to eight weeks. And the, the, the pondering starts to become like, do you need over speed training? Um, how much would you really need? Do I need to get really good at, let's say running 520 pace and that's enough learning how to relax at that pace versus mm -hmm. strain at that pace or is ripping miles and even some quarter mile in and outs with short recoveries. Is that going to move 520 pace to 515 pace, for example, right. on race day? And don't get me, I don't know if I'll run even close to those paces, but what I'm getting at is, well, I don't know. Everybody always says they need more speed work. Everybody. How many of your athletes on occasion, are like, I, I feel like I need more speed work. I need more speed work. And you're like, what is speed work? What do you, what do you mean by speed work? I feel right. like that conversation comes up all the time, especially with my ultra athletes. My ultra athletes claim to feel super durable, but slow. I'm like, well, you're racing a hundred K. So you tell me where are we at in this speed work conversation? And then they go out and crush it. Right. Did you right. need speed work? What is speed work? So it's all just circling around. Yeah. So I guess I'll try to re-clarify slightly without fully nailing it down yet. I have come to be a three zone runner. I only use three heart rate zones. I'm either below anaerobic. I mean, sorry, let me start over. I'm either below aerobic threshold. So I'm either fully aerobic. Mm -hmm. That's zone one. I'm between my two thresholds. That's zone two. Or I'm over my anaerobic threshold. That is zone three. Those are my only zones I care about heart rate wise. If I'm any slower or any fat, mm -hmm. if I'm slower than zone one, like anything under that is really doesn't matter to me. And if I am over that, now I only care about effort or pace if I am up in the threes. Mm -hmm. So th yes, there are more deviations in there, but in terms of heart rate zones, I don't care about any other heart rates other than the two thresholds defining it. So for starters, if it is not above anaerobic threshold, I just cannot be convinced that it's speed work. Even if you're training for a 24 hour race, and mm. I've probably said something on here before, like if you're an sure. ultra runner, marathon pace is speed work. Well, it's over race pace work, but I will contradict myself and say, no, it's just not speed work. So it must be in my zone three. It must be above anaerobic or lactate threshold to even have it appear like if I was searching for things, it wouldn't even appear in the search unless it qualified above mm -hmm. anaerobic threshold. That's where I will start. That's my first delineation. Clear as mud. As Good. my college physiology professor would say to us mm -hmm. when we looked at him with blank stares. Uh, but that makes sense. I go more and more to that sort of model. Like, do we need five zones? Do we need six zones? Do mm -hmm. we need four zones? What do we really need? Because how much hair splitting do we need to do? Running mile pace, right? Running 5 gate pace. You're not worried about heart rate anymore. So I don't care for heart rate. I'm not saying those zones don't exist. I just don't need a heart rate for that mm -hmm. zone. Yeah, no, that, that made sense. That was fairly clear. It's just, this is such a cloudy conversation, right? Yes. But I think here's where I struggle with that point. Okay. Or I think listeners might struggle with that point would just be, so threshold work should be the nucleus of your quality training. If you're racing, even if a mile or above, right? Mm -hmm. The best in the world threshold is still the epicenter of what they're doing. Um, so threshold heart rate, potentially, if you're not going, if you're not breaching lactate threshold, mm -hmm. well, I could probably go run four, 400 meter repeats fairly quickly. Yep. Maybe just peak at threshold by the end. And then it comes back down. So are you implying that if you don't breach threshold, that it may not be speed, speed work? Is that more or less what you're saying? Or it's one of your lines in the sand? No, because I'm going to cloud it further and say that. If you did 50 meter runs at 400 meter race pace, you may never breach threshold with enough rest in between. That's true. So there has to be a That's pace true. correlation to it. Um, 
So I'll, I'll guess I'll just make it as dialed in as I can personally make it. I don't think I ever start thinking that and anything... to interject. Okay. <laughs> to, to interject, uh, this is a mess and it's by design. Yes. I didn't have a clear answer. Now I have something I'm going to say that is concise after this. Like, okay, so here's what I think after running today and the thoughts mm -hmm. in my head, I have it. I just wanted to jumble it all up first before we, I don't know, stand on our rocks, so to speak. Right. So anyways, just because I want people are probably like, where's this going? And like, I don't really know, but I have an idea. So yeah. I'm going to Go try ahead. to stand Sorry on a rock here. If, if I'm thinking here yeah. of anything I would ever give an athlete that I would consider speed work, I'm going to say that it must be faster than 5K pace for me to consider it speed work. Now, there are other things I might consider, but like without having to think faster than 5K, yeah, we're, we're, this is speed work today. Realistically, I would probably call it VO2 max work or faster because a 30-minute 5K athlete is not doing speed work at 29-minute race pace. But just for the sake of drawing one unclear line in the sand, faster than 5K pace work, I'm going to call speed work. You see how I was shaking my head back and forth at you? You were either disappointed that I said it or you disagree with me. And if you're disappointed that I said it, it's because you were going to say it. Yeah, I'm disappointed that you said it because you you open the door for exactly what I was going to say to try to clear this up. Okay. Today absolutely did not feel like speed work. I'll say it. My stretch goal, and I don't even know if I'll come close. I have an A, B, and C goal for this half. 110 flat is 521 mile pace. Okay? Two of my four reps were faster than that. Average, right? For my workout. So technically, by one of the standards, we could call that speed training because two reps mm -hmm. were faster than goal pace, two were slower. So whatever. Um, it wasn't speed work today, brother. It wasn't even close to speed work today. It was stay power, sit in it, threshold, the efficiency work, fine for that. But that didn't, that wasn't speed work. I'm telling you what I felt, how I moved. Mm -hmm. The end result of that was grit, grind mostly threshold, like sitting it. That was not speed work. So after analyzing the workout and coming back and thinking, okay, so if my logic of quarter mile repeats are speed work for a mile is sound, then two mile reps for a half marathon clearly is sound. It's not. We can try to doll it up and we can justify it however we want. Um, for those who avoid speed work in particular, like some people, I don't know why they hate it, but they do. I look forward to those days, uh, emotionally and mentally, they're so much easier with the breaking it up. And anyways, mm -hmm. uh, I have decided at roughly 5k pace or faster, maybe 10k pace, maybe, but I think 5k pace is the clear line in the sand or faster. And you could do mile repeats could be speed workout. If you're aiming for 5k goal pace or faster, like it could extend mm -hmm. up as far as that. And you could make an argument for 10k pace, but I think your 5k pace and faster is exactly right. And this is all, this is, could be subjective by many people's opinion. Um, but I feel like no matter what the race distance, it could be your ultra, your hub a hundred miler, as you said, is 25 miles speed work for a hundred. No, um, I think you have to open it up and get quite uncomfortable compared to the pacing you are going to run in your race, that it's so far faster or ahead of what your goal intended average pacing is that you're accessing a, almost a completely new stride, a completely uh, more powerful stride, a completely more costly stride, because what okay. we need to get here is perspective. We need to get perspective that the race we have coming up is going to be more relaxed than that workout we just ran. It's going to be more comfortable than that workout we ran. The stride's gonna feel less costly than that workout we ran. And I went and ran in the stride at the effort in which I'm going to race at, and it didn't feel like a speed session. So I think even if it's subjectively for perspective, it's like you've broken through some sort of barrier. And even if you never touch that stride on race day, I think per perception and perspective is key. And today was a 
very productive session for me. This session will move the needle further than any speed in quote session I could do. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're really talking true speed, it needs to be at or so much further than your intended race pace that the uncomfortability helps you settle into your future race. I think 5k pace is a good delineator right there. So you did steal my point. I was going to elaborate, but as you often do, because I ask you the questions first, you beat me to it because you're a jerk. It's my MO today, Kirk. And I don't, I honestly don't feel that bad about it. I'm hangry right now. All right. This is going on hour three straight of talking and you're just getting what you get. So here's what I would say then. So what do you think of all that? I like it. I do. And this is one of those topics that because we don't have a definition for it, we have to talk ourselves into a place of comfort with an answer. So I started by saying it's either got to be faster than a race pace or it has to open your stride up to the point where it's a more aggressive stride, a deviation, more aggressive, open aggre and uh, like forceful. So are we just saying it has to check both boxes, not one? It can't check one or two. It has to check both. Yeah, it's got to be faster than race pace, but it also has to be more aggressively strided than race pace. Or does the second one? What do you think? How do you consume the first with it? Like you can't run more aggressively than race pace stride wise without naturally being faster. Is it just redundant to have both boxes to check? I don't think so because we're going to skirt the lines of everything we do. And there's gray area with everything uphill running but i mean Technical sure you terrain, can running, simplify it. compromised running you oh, might be running right. slower but you can open up and crank harder i, I want you to right so i want you to give your take so i didn't mention i mentioned like the perspective which i think is everything mm -hmm. right like over striding over a slightly more aggressive costly energy strength mm -hmm. output stride Again, it's the same thing as if you're in the gym and you work to squatting 225 and you work your way up and like 185 in the warm up feels like, oh, that was heavy today. And then you put on 205 in your next warm up, you're like, oh, that's heavy today. And then you get to 225 for your heavy working sets. And you're like, oh, that was work, but I got it. And then you bump down for one last set at 185 just for funsies to cap off. And you're like, that was easy. You know that perspective? You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? On the build up, it can feel like a lot of work. And then you get to your over speed set, which would be 225. You hit it a few times and then you back down to your sustainable, maybe reps of 10 at 185. And you're like, well, that, why did that feel so much better the second time after I hit the heavy stuff than it did the first time in route to the heavy stuff? And I feel like accessing speed works the same way. Mm -hmm. That's as simple as I can put it. I believe that. You've I'm experienced that. that. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone's line is going to be a little different. So how do you do some people that might be 205, some people might be 195. Well, sure. Like the, the difference between people sealing in their threshold really determines how much over do you have to do? You have people who visually like Matt Centrowitz, who doesn't look like the stride changes ever. You watch him in that real final in Brazil at the Olympics running a 50.9 or something last 400 meters. And it, he accelerated. I think it was every... six. I just watched that. Really? 56, 50.6, 50.7. 50 it was under, yeah, it was fast. I just yeah. watched it this week. I love that. That is one of my favorite races to revisit. But he gets faster every step of that race, especially over the last 500 meters. And his stride doesn't really look any different coming down the home stretch. Not much. Maybe at the end a little bit. But even with 200 meters to go, when he's running 49, 48 second, 400 meter pace, He's still looking like he's running 5K pace. So there are some people who their stride line is different from their exertion line. But I don't think it changes the fact that you have to be feeling more aggressive than you'll ever have to be on race day to consider it speed work. I agree. I, I've been wondering about Matt Centrowitz lately. Um, you're seeing him show up at all these big 1500s mm -hmm. and these miles. He's I think making one last Hail Mary at the Olympic mm -hmm. games, he's getting his butt handed to him by young kids. I mean, he just got smashed by Nico and Colin Salmon in the 15. He's been in the back or middle of the pack. I'm just very curious. I'm secretly rooting for him because he's on the older, uh, end of the age and spectrum now. Surgery. 
and he's a former he's right and he had a Right. He had a big injury history and it's just, he's fun to see him fighting and clawing and not giving up, even though he's not where he was. I'm just curious if he'll put it together by June. Be fun to see. It will be. There are some runners who, you know, are born to run. They're genetically designed to run because they're so fast. And then there are others who have one extra component in there, which is they look like there is no effort ever exerted when they run fast. And that's him. He has the most Mm -hmm. effortless looking speed that you could ever ask for. He may not have the prettiest stride. I'm sure there are bouncier, more pleasing to look at strides, but you will not find someone who looks like the speed costs them less. And that is like true talent in some capacity right there. He's very contained and even more contained Grant Fisher, who's also very little wasted energy in his movement, arm mm-hmm. carriage, legs. Reminds me of Brian Butler Butzler a little bit. All right. Oh, a little Butzler, yeah. I ran behind him a bit for a year. Uh, all right. So um, we're, trying to, we're trying to skin this speed cat. And I think the way I want to um, sort of head this conversation is using me for an example then. Okay. Let's use me as an example. I think that's just going to be the best way for people to understand how we think of this. So... Um, half marathon, 13.1 miles, fairly flat road race coming up. And let's say it's six weeks out, seven weeks out, somewhere in there. Um, what would, what would you consider then like applicable speed work workouts for, let's say a race that's one to two hours for most people running a half, you're going to fall somewhere in there one, I should say one to two and a half hours, but let's just say one to two hours. Yeah. Where would you start then? Where would you, as I'm starting to create my own training plan, um, I'm going to be patient with the speed work. May I add just a little bit right now, but because as you know, me and you both turn pretty quick. Yes. It can go from feeling not fast in three weeks to three weeks later feeling, uh, peaked. So how would you open that box then for somebody racing one to two hours? I like the idea of spending the majority of your time becoming as effortless and fast at your actual race stride as possible. And for most people, I'm just calling that threshold. So I'm still doing two out of every three. I would be doing engine, engine, and then perspective. Engine, engine, perspective. Engine, engine, perspective. So it would be like maybe a Monday, Thursday, Saturday. Monday, Thursday, Saturday. Give myself a little time in between now, not the classic Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, because your workouts are just big four by two miles that you just did Kirk. That's a big workout that leaves you beat up a little bit. So I would go race stride, race stride, perspective stride or threshold, threshold speed. That's where I would go for the vast majority of it. I think I would only play around with how much you're doing on the speed day. And if you're doing anything else along with it, Mm. And if you're trying to make that what I would call an engine day with Correct. short recoveries, but still trying to keep speed, or if you're going to take big rest and really over swing on the speed side, not worry about the engine as much as the run economy and biomechanical efficiency, right? Those are like the hairs yeah. you need to split. Um, so I think I'm going to, I'm going to err on the threshold. I mean, I, I was running in the one eighties, the entire last mile, like my threshold was breached brother. Like I was, <laughs> I was working a little too hard, right? You hit a headwind, the the heart rate spikes, eight beats a minute, happened to hit a headwind in the last half mile. And it, I'm committed, right? I'm not right. slowing down. I'll sink my teeth into it. So who knows what that does, but I think, I think the slow and steady long run is going to be fewer and far between in this build. In fact, I think I'm going to squeeze in some of that longer type stuff mid long run. There's going to be very few long runs where I go out and plot at seven minute pace. It's going to be like a lot of quality long, just get used to that. Like I go right to stride and I'm comfortable with it, whether it's for fartlek style sessions Mm -hmm. or extended tempo work or whatever it may be. And then slowly but surely shift some of those earlier week workouts, gradually cut them shorter and shorter uh, on the rep duration and faster and faster on the speed output. So I think I'm going to more like gradually land the plane, but the mm-hmm. two, two, three would work if I were doing three quality sessions a week, but I'm not right. Sounds great in theory. Well, in, but I'm going to stick to two. Keep going. 
No, that's it. Go ahead. Okay. No, that's it. I'm going to stick to two, period. Well, and I just recently have uh, two people I'm working with who set half marathon PRs, and both of them were on two quality workouts a week. Awesome. And we weren't touching the speed like front. Like a... Hmm. We did shorter. I don't think most people need to. No. I mean, yes, but like with strides and stuff are enough. Uh, we did shorter to medium threshold reps, and then we did longer half marathon paced reps. We're just doing classic 10 by three minutes or five by six or something midweek. And on the weekends, we were doing quality long run, longer intervals, three by two mile, three by 5K, 15, 10, 10, five, things like that. So we, we were just doing the two that you're doing. Uh, we didn't touch the speed for either of them because a we weren't trying to get too sharp because there are other goals coming along and b the uh neither of them were trying to run 520 pace and at 520 pace the line's a lot smaller between your your 520 and your five flat like um 5k pace or 450 like that the the space between is smaller and so you do need a bit of that to incite change in your stride but um we were comfortable with them running it purely off strength. So yeah, I'm I'm a proponent of two quality, bigger quality sessions a week for a half marathon. I think that's great. And then that, that allowed them to still do some long runs if they wanted. You're not going to have that. You're going to have yep. to get some faster stuff, split tempo, quality long. Uh, I was sitting on the couch and my sweaty butt print was firmly imprinted on that thing by the time I got back up because I came in the door uploaded my run to Strava, labeled it, whatever. And I'm scrolling and I see Dakota Linworm. I started following her last week mm. on Strava and it said Dakota Linworm, or no, it said Tyler German ran with Dakota Linworm. Mm. Uh, they ran together this morning. And I think that's how I started following her. I forget. Maybe it was just this morning, but it doesn't matter. Anyways, like, oh, Dakota Linworm's on Strava. I'm going to check out what she's doing. Now, Dakota Linworm was third at the U.S. Olympic Trials. And she's going to the Olympics for the marathon. And Tyler Jaman uh, and Dakota Lindworm, they run for Minnesota Distance Elite. They got a crew of really fast athletes. That's who Dakota runs with. That's who Tyler runs with. Uh, Tyler's been on our podcast twice. Anyways, what the workout they did this morning, 1,200-meter repeats on concrete around Lake Calhoun. Okay? Dakota Lindworm's running a full marathon, hitting 1,200-meter repeats, and they were ripping. They were running 440s pace, 450. I mean, she were running fast. Like, she was running quick, under five-minute pace, I believe, for these things. And then you start to think, okay, well, if somebody's training is, uh, has access to some great training programs, uh, coaching, and is an Olympian or future Olympian, running notably faster than her race pace, which her race pace was roughly 540 pace when she qualified, 530, 535 to 540 pace out ripping, seen value this far out from the Olympic Games, running that fast, along with Tyler German. It just started like really just the Pandora's box was like, like I think I could get, if I never did a rep shorter than two miles, I think I'm going to get 98% of to my potential on race day. If two yeah. miles was the shortest I went, I could do two mile repeats with five minute rest and rip. I could probably get close to, I mean, I could, we could go back on our words and say, that's speed training for the half marathon. I think to access just the tip, just the tip of the iceberg, I think is what we're dissecting when it comes to this stuff. I really do. Don't you believe like your athletes that you said, it's confusing, stirring the pot even more. Like how much over speed training did they do? How close to their potential did they get? Right? Like I still think like speed work 3%, I mean, 3%, which is a lot. 3% can yeah. mean 15 seconds a mile, maybe. I don't know, depending on your pacing. But, like, you agree. You, I, I trust you probably will agree with this, but maybe you'll fight me. Well, that's the The other caveat. stuff gets you 95-plus percent of the way there. Yeah. The great caveat is how close to the ceiling did they get? They PR'd? Yes. But are they close to their ceiling? <clears throat> I don't believe so. I believe both will, will and can run significantly faster. And we both had that conversation that like, like I talked about Corey just had his seven minute PR in the half or whatever it was. Uh, but he has another half and fall. Yeah. And that's the one that matters to him. This was a test run. You can bet that as we get closer to that one, there's going to be faster work that happens. 
we can simply repeat the block we just yep. did, but with a third dose of speed throughout the week. And now he's going to access faster running on race day. There's no way around it. You know, it might be, he might stick with his, mm -hmm. uh, maybe he's Tuesday, Saturday in midweek, instead of a midweek long run, he's doing a midweek normal length run with a minimum effective dose of like 5k pace or mile pace work in there. Just running a few mm -hmm. of them, but getting not damage from it, but skill and perspective and efficiency. That's just one easy way to take your base training up one more notch and get that much closer yeah. to your ceiling. And the catch 22 with the whole damn thing is that your speed is absolutely no good if you can't hold it, at yeah. least a percentage of it. And it's so, speed is necessary, but it's so over romanticized and oh, so glorified. Yeah. But it's just, that's just the icing, right? On the cake. And yes, it's worth talking about. And yes, I'm going to spend a lot of brain power and time figuring out how I want to access that because percentage points matter when you care as much as we do mm -hmm. and our athletes do and our listeners do. But it's like, you know, it's like meat and potatoes is not even what we're talking about today. We're talking about that little side dish of flan and you're served at the end of your meal. Like Ooh, what that's going to be like. How cultured like of you. 98% of, 98% of your meal is, is the stuff we're not talking about, which is the threshold and low grade time on feet. So it's just, it's just a little bit of a mind boggle, man. Like if you yeah. really think about it, mind well, boggle. I, I just want to take a look at the people I have in my life. So we have John DeWitt, which who you and I both know. He was also an Oshkosh guy. I've never met uh, him. He, you've never but met I know him of actually. Him. Hmm. Well, never met him in person. I am significantly faster than John DeWitt at speed. Significantly right. faster. I have a tremendous amount of fast twitch muscle compared to John. But what distance do he and I overlap at? If we were to race every distance on earth and we started at a, a 40 meter dash or 40 yard dash even and move upwards, where do we even out? Where are we in a dead heat with each other? Or where does he start winning? Somewhere between you know, I've had this talk. in a mile. Yeah, we think it's 2K. I mean, that's be my guess. We think it's 2K. Oh, just over a mile. Okay. Yeah. One quarter mile lap farther than a one mile race. By the time we get to 3K or two miles, he's significantly better than me. And his PRs are significantly better. I'm significantly better at the 800. I'm a bit better at the mile. And he's significantly better at the two mile. That tipping point is early. It is mm -hmm. depressingly early. All my speed in the world doesn't do a single thing for me. Every lap past what we called somewhere between a mile and 2K. I win nine times out of 10 in a mile. He wins 10 times out of 10 at a two mile. <laughs> that, is, that is a small, depressingly small window. And that's what we need to remember about speed work is that you can use it to help mm. your engine, but it does not replace your engine. You cannot rely upon it as your engine. It's just like flushing the coolant and giving it an oil change. It's going to run just slightly more optimally, but the, the lay person isn't going to notice the difference. I'd even say it I might mean, be as good as throwing a supercharger on the engine. Or Ooh, a turbocharger super on the charger. engine. Doesn't change the fact okay. that you're stuck with a four banger. <laughs> you don't have a V10. You know, it's not important. It's important against other people with your engine size. It's going to make you hit top speeds better, but it's not going to help you run a marathon. It's not going to help you run a 5K. It will just make you better at the things you can already do. Um, that's really good perspective, actually, that comparison between you and John, John DeWitt. Um, <clears throat> I think more than anything I want to get across today that as seasoned and tenured as Bracken and I are, we have hundreds of athletes in our corral that we're coaching and thousands now of case studies between the people we've coached over decades. Um, we still lie awake in bed at night in quandary of what and how to do things at times. And mm -hmm. we are our own case study and subject studies and like still curious. Um, I'm not claiming to know everything. Bracken certainly doesn't know everything. We know a heck of a lot and a heck of a lot more than most people. 
in this space. And yet here we are, can't even come up with a perfectly clear, concise answer. And this is our world necessarily of what this thing is speed over speed training. We have ideas, we're putting it into some sort of box, but I just find it like sort of humble and a little bit to be like, I don't know. Yeah, what it sucks. Uh, you <laughs> know, it's, it's, beautiful. it's just, it's, am it's amusing. <laughs> right. It's still learning. So I want to ask you a question, um, Kirk. All right. Well, <clears throat> I know we only have a right, minute. Well, here. we got to go in like a minute and a half. You get yeah. no explanation of it. You just have to answer the question and then I'll answer it. If you said, okay. I went to the track and did speed work today, what, how, what workout or image pops into your mind? No explanation. Just say what it is. I did speed work today. Uh -huh. Four by four by four by 400 meters. Um, Half, half mile repeats with structured rest two two plus minutes um my mind doesn't go any further than a half mile just in my brain it's my brain's okay. like half mile or less for me uh and the variation of those can go but right away quarters four by four by 400 meters that's 16 reps bigger rest between sets i know i'm gonna run fast i know i'm gonna get engine work so that's what i think that's just where my mind goes that's a mm -hmm. great question what about you and mine is either uh, 12 by 400 with 100 meter slow jog rest at 3k pace or something mm. like 200s at 800 meter pace or 200s at mile pace. So in both of those, never once when I thought Ripping. I went and did speed work, did I think slower than two mile race pace? Never once thought of it. And maybe that's all we need to know. Both of us thought of short, fast things that are significantly faster than any race we're preparing for. Yeah, and even my half mile repeats when I run those, my goal is to run faster than 5k pace. Yeah. So your case in point. Yeah. We can debate all <laughs> we, we could have just said that off the front and Yeah. But our mind goes right to that. It. Right to that. Um is is uh is like impending doom happening over in your end? It's gone from bright and sunny to like I can barely see you. <laughs> yeah. This is the second time today. We had storms off on the horizon and they were on us downpour like minutes earlier today. And now that's hitch black again, we're just getting batted uh, around by these storms. Um, Bracken looks like he's sitting in a dark closet chatting to me all of a sudden. It's a little bizarre, but um, all right, guys, I hope you're good and confused uh, at the end of this 50 minutes of babble. Uh, maybe you got something out of it. Maybe you didn't, but at least it got you thinking would be our hope. Um, and if we did that, I guess mission accomplished today, Bracken. I'm glad you came up with this. I enjoyed this conversation. It's the non-specific answers that I get the most out of. And we've been very specific with many episodes recently, and this is yes. a little bit of an outlier. So it was fun for us to just stumble over our words, but, uh, thanks for listening guys. We will catch you later this week. Yep.